Welcome to Community Conversation. This is show two in our series that we're doing in conjunction with the Community Education Channel here at Dixie State University. The show is coming to you live from the studios on campus at Dixie State. And uh, tonight we've assembled uh, an interesting audience here, an interesting group of people to go through and talk about some issues and hopefully maybe raise some point and counterpoint and get into a crucial conversation that uh, has been long since overdue, especially as we're looking down the, the barrel of a political process uh, as far as the elections are concerned and then with everything else that's going on around us, uh, we need to be talking about these things and not necessarily to find the answers to them, but at least to get some questions out there and to understand different standpoints that we have going on. But before we do that, uh, we're going to start off with a, with a song because our producer wanted to introduce a little bit of culture into the show tonight and we're so all going to be the, the beneficiaries of that. So I'm going to hand this over to Doug Caputo, who's going to introduce our, our singing guest tonight. Thank you, Eric. Um, so I am fortunate and have been fortunate for a number of years to participate in um, a sweat lodge ceremony on a fairly regular basis by a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, and I have asked his niece, Hilda Richards, to uh, come and sing one of the songs that we sing in the sweat lodge as uh, kind of, I don't know that a lot of people get a chance to hear these things and, and Hilda's got a beautiful voice. I know she's very nervous, but she's, um, she's favored me by uh, agreeing to do this. So Hilda, can I ask you to come up? And Hilda's here with her mom, Phyllis. And she has total freedom to pick whichever song she wants to. So you do your thing and then get off the stage. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. What, tell us a little bit about the Eagle song real quick. It's just like, it's like when we're doing it in the um, sweat lodge, it's for like healing people because the Eagle means a lot to us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. May I please have an application? Thank you. Skip the drama. Get your diploma. Okay. 
Take that first step towards a better future. Find free adult education classes at finishyourdiploma.org. There is a place where rocks bleed and nature blushes on a battlefield green with envy. Where dimples determine destiny and a tiny wooden tee holds the outcome in the balance. There is a place where friends are opponents and opponents are friends. Where the prize is elusive, the conquest is captivating and the score is unsettled till the drinks are down. There is a place. Here we are, are we up? Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm uh, Eric Young. I'm hosting this uh, exchange here this evening. And uh, for those of you at home, you've uh, probably seen that we've divided our audience out into two different sides. And as I look at, there we go. So I have the left side over here, camera left, camera right. Left maybe being something more along the liberal side, perhaps right being more something along the, the conservative side. The whole concept here, hopefully, is as we get discussing ideas that, and as we become maybe provisional in that discussion, that uh, we might maybe move sides a little bit. Well, I don't know, it's an experiment. We'll see how it works, if it works at all. Or maybe we'll get entrenched maybe in our positions and decide not to budge. And there's nothing wrong with that either. What I don't want to happen is silence. <laughs> uh, we need to get a conversation going on here. And so we've invited two individuals to help maybe move that along. Uh, the first of which is my good friend, Janice Brooks. Um, Janice, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe why you're here? She's got a mic on her that way. She's good that way. Well, my uh, background, I work for the Department of Energy. I've got my uh, undergraduate degree, bachelor's degree in criminal justice, and a master's degree in public policy. Um, I worked for the Department of Energy and Security Operations for about nine years, and, um, and then have always been involved in the political process on the periphery. Um, and then put a bridge into my life and to uh, work in the community and the arts, and then have slowly over the years but those two aspects of myself as a creative arts, a pa patron of the arts, as a performer, um, into an arena. So uh, that's a nutshell about me. Good. Glad to have you <laughs> joining us here and help Thank you. maybe frame some ideas as we go back and forth. And on this side, in this corner, I have my good friend Shadman Bashir as well. Would you give us a little bit of background as to maybe why we decided to bring you on board? Because I'm the immigrant. Because you're the immigrant. <laughs> the immigrant. You're the token immigrant. Yeah. Here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was born and raised in uh, northwestern Pakistan. The, um, I grew up in crowds. I mean, some of, some of my friends became Taliban. The other friends became army officers. And they start killing each other. So I grew up in that kind of an environment. Um, I came to the U.S. in 2000, uh, went to school over here. I have a background in English law, in Islamic law, and in U.S. law. I teach at Dixie, um, I teach um, at the business school, the criminal justice department and the political science department. Uh, with a background um, in the tribal areas of northwestern Pakistan, I kind of went into understanding war, terrorism, religion, us and them. So that kind of pushed me towards starting some new classes over here at Dixie, like global law and war and terrorism. And I'm here because I like you. Oh, well, gosh, thank you. I like you, too. Glad to have you Excellent. here. And then we have the rest of our audience as well. And some, uh, we're very fortunate to have you all here. And as we've been talking pre-show uh, and getting to know you a little bit, or at least to getting to know what, you wanted, what it is that you want to talk about, we're finding some uh, very interesting areas of expertise, not the least of which we've discovered with John here, who I want to open the show with you. Would you recapitulate uh, what it was that you were saying before we... Yeah, I, should, uh, I was a law enforcement officer for over 33 years and uh, worked the West Coast uh, anti-terrorist unit with the FBI. And what's interesting is that what we're seeing over time is that ideology is trumping common sense and logic many times. And the real question is, what is it that you want your law enforcement officers to do? Hey, John, let me stop you there, because I want there's two things here that I want to address with that. First off, the idea of ideology trumping common sense. Take that apart for us, would you? What that means is to us in law enforcement is that we work under a system of laws. And the laws are passed on by the various political entities throughout the communities that we work. 
There are certain things that make absolute common sense, and that's the old English common law, and that's what we as a law enforcement officer are working under. What's the common law? However, what we're seeing in the country now is that there are so many political ideologies floating around, and what they do is from city after city, from state to state, whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat, you're now having your ideology start to dictate how it is that you want your law enforcement officers to behave. Whether or not you're in a section of town uh, that's highly minority, whether it's black or Hispanic, whether you're in a very wealthy neighborhood, how do you want the, the law to be enforced? Do you want it differently or do you want to have it exactly the same? Do you want to have a city in San Francisco that uh, has now become a sanctuary city and another city, perhaps in the Midwest, that wants to uh, go ahead and get rid of all illegals that are there? So that's the problem that we see in law enforcement. Let's look for an answer to that question. What do you want from law enforcement? Janice, looks like you've got something to say. Uh, well, I think there is, at which end of what you, uh, let's, if we take uh, guns for control and law enforcement's use of that, then there's two ends of that gun in terms of the decision that has to be made of, are we going to decide of what, what the public wants from the shooter's point of view, or what the public wants from the person that is being shot. So at both ends of those guns are two issues of what do we want the public to okay, do, and well I don't think it's just law enforcement. What if it's the law, so the law enforcement's on the one end of the gun? Oh no, and if you look at the other the end, there's end another the issue of what do we want the law to do, and not, so enforcement is on both ends of that gun. To okay, me. all right. But are we answering the question there, or, or are we raising more questions with that response? Um, well, I think we have to, the question is what's the shared value and okay. who's, you have to decide to me when I, when, I, when I think of that question, what do we want the law enforcement to do, then I have to say on which end or else I'm only deciding what I want the law enforcement so John, to do from the shooter's about? point of well, view. The problem is when you want a law enforcement officer, when you've picked up that telephone and you've called 911, you're calling them to come out and to do what? When a law enforcement officer is coming to the scene, that law enforcement officer, he or she, their job is to go ahead and stop whatever violence or potential violence is going on. And they have a few seconds to make a decision. Things have changed since we have terrorism, and I'm glad that you're here. It used to be, years ago, that we would respond and the first thing our tactical teams would do is I would order them to negotiate bring in the negotiator, quiet the scene down, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate before anything else happens. And if that doesn't work, negotiate one more time before you send in the shooters, you send in the SWAT teams. Now, because of what's happened with terrorism, they're now teaching that you go in immediately and start taking out the shooter because the shooter is now changed. It is no longer a domestic dispute. It's no longer an armed robber. It is now a terrorist who is committed to die in advance. And the only thing that's gonna stop that terrorist is to incapacitate them. How does the law enforcement officer know what they're dealing with when they go in the door? Let's define terrorists there, because for many people we think of terrorists and, and we get into some stereotypes. Mm -hmm. The kind of terrorism you're talking about though is some level of gun violence leveled against uh, an innocent population of sorts. Is, is that fair to say? The, the terrorism has a very broad definition, as the other gentleman will know when he speaks to it. You can have terrorism based upon a religious ideology. You can have terrorists based on a political ideology. You can get all the way down to somebody who's terrorizing a population because they want to be killed by a cop, suicide by police officer. And they're almost the same mentality. They're going into that situation to die. And unfortunately, in this, a police officer or an FBI tactical team, we don't know most of the time who it is that we're doing, uh, dealing with. What kind of a terrorist is it? Is it a gang that's terrorizing the neighborhood? Or is it somebody from uh, uh, Osama bin Laden? Uh, that kind of a terrorist. Okay. We don't know. Let me roll this back a little bit and, and rephrase your question if I could. What kind of cop do you want? What kind of police force? Do you want? Certainly there's got to be an opinion here. Charles, is there a mic? Can I sure. borrow your mic there? Thank you. <laughs>
You did well. There you go. Uh, first of all, I think we kind of, I, I put uh, the area that we live in is kind of like Happyville, uh, okay, because the area that I'm from is, is uh, a war going on, and that is Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and so what do I want from a police officer and how we uh, go about answering that is totally different in Jackson, Mississippi. The pol police officer in Jackson, Mississippi, he's called out to a domestic dispute on the black side of town. He waits. He gets the call. He don't shoot out there. He waits to see what happens because he might be running into a bunch of gunfire. And what he gets paid for that to risk his life is not worth it. Now, on the other side of town, on the white side of town, which they call the North End, they, he gets a call, that same call, full speed ahead, because he better respond to the white side of town to stop a domestic dispute, no matter what it is. No matter he, what. He better be there on the black side of town. Everybody understand that he's, he's waiting. Regardless of the cop's race, is that right? Yeah, this is the cop. He's waiting. And the, the chief knows he's waiting because what they get paid is not worth risking their life when they know that nine times out of ten, whoever's in that house got guns. Okay. Okay, so to me it's kind of like unfair to ask that question. What kind of cop do you want? Right. Okay, because we're basing it on, to me, a certain kind of population. It's all based on context. Yes. My favorite okay. word. My, my verbiage is not of the highest level. So I'm kind of I'm kind of simple in my in what I say. So uh, I instantly re relate to my hometown, where it's a totally different world. So if you want to the South, let's say Chicago right now, where this past summer we had over thirty something people killed in one weekend. Okay, what do you want the police to do? Do you want them to just go in and get himself murdered? Because he's probably gonna get shot. Okay. okay? So when you say that question, what do you want for the police officer? Well, it's hard to ask because until you put yourself in the police's shoes, like I say, he's got a family at home. Does he run in and risk his life and leave his kids at home for you? Yeah, at the end of the day, okay. he wants to go home. Next week, it might be you with a gun shooting at the police officer. We don't know. So it's kind of, to me, I, I get kind of uh, emotional about them kind of questions because okay. we're living in Happyville. Here. Here. Southern Utah, Happyville. Yes, sir. Anybody want to address that? <laughs> what, what do you want from our cops here? Do you... I'm going to talk about this a okay. little bit. Um, I've, I've, uh, I went to Catholic schools in Pakistan, and I tell people that we have Christian missionary schools. They're like, really, you guys have that? We had the biggest mosque in Peshawar in the middle and a Catholic and Protestant church on each side. So we'd pray in the mosque and play cricket in one of the <laughs> churches because they had big crowns. Um, I've been to churches over here. When I'm in a church over here, I hear people talking about love and everyone is happy and everyone is excited and uh, how God loves you and all those kind of things. Coming back to your point, you take the same church and put it in Syria or in Middle East or some country where there's a war going on, the sermons are different, the feelings are different, people are more on edge. Because What's the rhetoric? What's said in those sermons? Or there, they're talking about war and violence. Either war which is going to go out from the church or the mosque out or the war that has been brought in by the people who live outside. So when you say happy meal, that, that just triggered that idea that um, what's around that church is brought into the church. So it's not starting from that religion or faith. The way uh, John, I, I think John, mm -hmm. when you said uh, the faith, it's her faith or his faith. I am from the same faith. I start thinking, how, why am I not doing the same thing when she was doing it? It gets confusing. When we go back to the, to the terrorism part, I use the word cocktail terrorism. What terrorism is it? Um, it's just like a cocktail. You put religion, you pay, uh, put economics, you put culture, you put anger, um, revenge, all of these things in there. And you make five people look at that cup. Each of the five people start seeing what they want to see or what they only can see. And that's how they define terrorism. For example, Afghanistan, the conflict, war zone. Um, is it a religious war? 
Is it a territorial war? Is it a tribal war? Is it ethnic? Is it customs? All of them. Yes. So all of them are there. It depends upon you which policy you make to tackle that. The problem is we make policies what we think are right and good for us, and we apply that to others. So what, so can, that's, we, what can we take from that model and apply locally in Happyville? That's, I, totally, I can't answer that question. When I explain to the students, sometimes some of the cases when I, when I cover that, when I'm talking about police officers, I'm like, well, police officers cross the line of which they are not supposed to cross. Always, no. You have to put yourself in that police officer's shoes. And when you are in that person's shoes, when you have the gun, it's shooting someone is way more complicated, way more difficult. You have to study the, the cases of post-traumatic stress disorder when sure. it happens because of the war. Most people get that when they shoot other people. So it's not some happy guy, he's going out, hey, I'm gonna be so happy, I'm gonna shoot people. No, no. you have to understand that. And that all comes from the environment outside that police station. If environment outside the police station is quiet and calm, the way the gentleman mentioned, police officer will act differently. It's a community officer. Community. It's not just that guy. It's all of us. So we've escalated to a point now that instead of negotiating, we're, we're engaging an active shooter. And instead of showing up in a cruiser or a motorcycle, we're showing up in something that's more militarized, where we've gone to an extreme in terms of how we expect or how we're seeing law being enforced. While at the same time, we're also arming the populace as well. Is this just going down the wrong road as a result of that? Dallas, you had a, a comment there. Do you still hear? I've got a microphone right here for you. So, so I, I wrote a couple of things down here. First, in response to your question, um, the officer over there, what, what do we expect from law enforcement? I think everybody would reasonably conclude that we expect an equal measure of accountability, if not more accountability, to whom much authority is given, much accountability is also required. And I don't mean to imply that there's not accountability in law enforcement, but we can see things like what just happened in Oregon where you know a group of armed militants took over a federal building and the reaction was measured. Negotiators were called in. 26 days of calculated, very measured negotiation took place. And we're, a lot of us are wondering, would that have happened if those were Islamic terrorists? And that's a fair question, and that's one to address. But uh, that said, um, what, what most people want from law enforcement, like I said, is an equal measure of accountability. And I'll give you a local example. A, a Utah Highway Patrolman responded to an accident off duty uh, close to 50 miles away. It was doing the better part of 100 miles an hour, which, which I understand having been in professional rescue that anything over 15 miles an hour code three is not acceptable. And he killed two people. And the local law enforcement community did not hold him accountable. And that in turn takes a community and begins to make us distrust our law enforcement officers. Let me segue into one more thing. I, I spent the better part of my adult life as a professional firefighter in Atlanta. And I used to tease the Atlanta PD quite a bit when they'd come to have dinner with us and say, wow, we, we both applied for our jobs at the same place, but you got in the wrong line, buddy. Um, you know, the difference between a firefighter and a cop is that everyone's always happy to see a firefighter. Policemen are, are tasked with probably the near most impossible job there is, I think, and, and nobody would disagree with that. Um, but I, I think that the question needs to be broader than that. It's not, we're, we're asking police to solve problems that are not theirs to solve. That's what the, was saying. Yeah, the, the problem is a community problem. And, and I think what we're seeing right now, the tension that's rising in this, in this country is a resurgence of anti-intellectualism. Is, is a resurgence of, 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 of very strong ideologies and entrenchments and an unwillingness to listen to any other point of view other than the one that you are predisposed to. Dallas, it's not cool to be an intellectual. Everybody knows that, right? Oh, <laughs> it isn't? Higher education is taking the biggest hit as oh, far as that's yeah. concerned. Well, yeah, and, and, and you know, I would encourage people to, to look back at the history of anti-intellectualism, maybe just go as far as 
little less than 100 years back in McCarthyism and that kind of thing. But we're seeing a resurgence of that. We're, we're academic conversation. And I'll, I'll, I'll dovetail with this, and I'll pass the microphone. Um, when you mentioned Fox News, people ask me why I go on a Fox News show and debate a Fox News commentator. C.S. Lewis, referring to, to theology, said that good theology must exist if for no other reason than bad theology must be answered. And I've just segued into that and said, you know, um, ridiculous and childish rhetoric must be answered. Good civil discourse must take place if for no other reason than out of control radical civil discourse must be answered. And that's up to us. And so I, 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 I am a huge supporter of law enforcement. And, and, and I do think that they've got probably the most impossible job in the world, but we have laid a, laid a burden at their feet and given them a problem that is almost near impossible to solve. It should be solved in our communities. It should be solved among us. What kind of radical discourse are we talking about here? I'm gonna take that segue and move on. Uh, in terms of radical discourse, we see this, uh, we're gonna see that in any campaign season, but for now we're seeing it a lot. Uh, specifically, that's coming to a point of dividing the GOP. Um, how do we respond or how do we even critically evaluate what's happening in terms of that kind of discourse? Any ideas? Do I need to give you more? Please. Actually, yeah, I do have a thought on that. Let me get a mic to you. Sure. Just a quick little background. I, I've worked in education for many years. I've been a teacher and an administrator. And so I don't mean to re make this reductionist, but um, I see a lot of the same things come up with my kids. You know, like classrooms are a microcosm of society, right? And what grade are you talking about? Um, fifth grade is okay. where I work mostly. And um, it comes down to me asking this question, well, what needs aren't being met or what needs are being spoken to by this inflammatory rhetoric? Um, I, I really appreciate what you said about ideology and ideologues kind of taking the place of, of common sense and, and humanity. So it's meeting some sort of need or a perceived you know, need or it's per, uh, there's this idea that it's meeting some needs. So I'm just curious what that need is. Um, I look at the rifts in my family politically. Um, I don't align with my grandpa, who is very, uh, gosh, super conservative and, and almost radically so. And um, as I've started to understand sort of his mindset, I realized, well, part of what the need that's not being met for him is he doesn't feel like his values are being espoused or even spoken about um, his at values large. or his ideology and is there a difference there I think that they that they cross yes they definitely dovetail but there is a difference there and so he doesn't feel like his values of like security economic security or physical security are being necessarily addressed right and so he hears something inflammatory and he can kind of he feels like he can sort through that um, but they're actually saying something that speaks his language, and so then he starts they aligning. Um, I'm thinking, I don't want to like throw the names, rhetoric but that's out yeah, there, the rhetoric though, that's is out speaking there to him. is speaking to him on some level. Does, does he indicate, uh, I'm going to be provocative here, does sure. he indicate to you what he has lost along the way and why he's so angry about that? Uh, that's a good question. That's hard for us to engage on that because I don't see the world in the same way he does. I don't feel like he's lost anything economically. But, but he obviously does because he does. he's angry about it. He does. And that, so I'm part of the problem there is that I'm not, and I appreciated what you had to say before the, the show started, that we're not really understanding the other side so we can't engage well. I don't engage well because I don't understand because, um, you know, I'm, I have my own sort of like views being younger than he is obviously and being female. And... Uh, so something's being met by listening to that inflammatory rhetoric, but I don't quite understand what. Interesting. What have we lost along the way? What are we taking America back from? Or what should we be maybe putting it to there? Uh, this, when, I, when I hear students bring up this question that, well, we, you know, we, the Constitution is broken, and, and we, <laughs> I ask them, tell me legislatively what has been lost under the watch of the, of the last administration for the last two years. Can you speak to that? Can anybody speak to that? Here, can I say something? Please. When I look at the, 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 uh, the process that we have right now, uh, I think we, we're getting an example of what's happening in the streets. When you look at Trump and how he's handling his campaign and the other side, I, I relate right back to the streets in that we're, first of all, we're not taking care of our streets in our cities. Uh, what we do now is... Are you talking infrastructure or metaphorically? 
Are you talking about the problem the people? people. Oh, okay. <laughs> with guns. Okay. Okay. My opinion is I don't know if I'm liberal or conservative or not. I'm let's keep it simple. It's way too many guns. And when you can go to Walmart and get a semi automatic weapon and walk out the door and you can go out there and spray people, to me that's just crazy that that accessibility to a murder weapon is that easy to get. I grew up with guns. My grandfather in Mississippi, we hunted coons and possum for a living. That's how we ate. We ate coons and possum. We sold the hide on the coon for gas money. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Okay? But now when you got 14, 13, 15-year-old kids running around with semi-auto wa automatic weapons that can kill somebody, and for me, they're killing my people. We're killing each other. So, you know, everything here is like either Muslim or uh, what do you want for us here? I've, I got to get back to we got a problem, first of all, with guns. And that balance is spreading over into what this strong, crazy mentality into politics. We never seen nothing like this before. Why? Because our, our world, the America, has so much violence going on. Now we're dealing with the police. Is the police wrong? Every time a police shoots somebody black, he did something wrong. That's the first thing that comes up. Well, he's not wrong all the time. Sometimes he's probably right. If I was dealing with my brothers in certain neighborhoods, I probably would have shot him too. Okay? I'm just keeping it real. Okay? Sometimes, yeah, is it excessive? Yes, it is excessive. Okay, but like you say, how can you judge? Because first of all, you're not in his shoes. You didn't see what he had to go out and deal with before this incident. You see, we didn't, we didn't cover that one, okay? We didn't cover the black officer that shot the black guy, you see? So, but we, we bring out in the media what we think makes money. Okay, now where did that come from? What is the root of that? You, you see what I'm saying? So- That's the vacuum of responsibility, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, so we, we got to get back, first of all, when we got a problem neighborhood, say black neighborhood, all the whites leave and go to the other side of town. Say, so let them Negroes kill themselves. When they get through killing themselves and the property value goes down, we'll come back in. We'll come back in, buy the property up, build it back up, get all of them out of there, and then we'll sell it to them so high that they can't move back in. Yeah, we call that's, it. that's the old school how we solve right. the problem. Gentrification. Man, we get, it's, it's a new era. Let me, let me go back then, for this, this concept of ideology versus common sense, how you've uh, coined that. So can't you kill more coons and, and uh, animals with a semi-automatic weapon than you could with a... It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Why not? You can kill a coon with a twenty-two. Oh, okay. You can kill a rabbit with a twenty-two. I can, I can survive with a twenty-two. But you could double your income that way, couldn't you, with a little more firing power? Maybe you could. You wouldn't have much animal left, I don't think, though. <laughs> As it were. Please, let's get your mic. You know, when I mentioned ideology, there's another way to intersperse that with another word, and that's communication. And what's breaking down, you talked about intellectualism. I think back a long time ago in college, I had a professor that said that functional intelligence, not IQ, but functional intelligence is directly proportional to the number of words and concepts that you know. If you go into a black community and you're a white police officer from a middle class neighborhood, you don't even speak the language. The professor and I talked about in the battlefield, and you've got a young Marine that's trying to take a terrorist in Afghanistan into custody. You don't even know what country is from. How do you even advise him of his rights? Is he speaking Farsi? Is he speaking Arabic? Is he speaking some dialect? So when you talk about ideology, it goes across the board, whether it's the political ideology in this country that's separating us, or whether it's the lack of communication that's separating us in the black community versus the white community. When he mentioned a police officer going to a call, I can remember as a young FBI agent going ahead and actually lecturing some people in Washington, D.C. And when I lectured overseas, it was the same problem. When you deal with FBI agents uh, in different parts of the country, they have entirely different experiences with the population base that they're assigned. And that's what's happening in the country. It's breaking down based upon political ideology, based upon your father, 
who is probably my age, sadly, uh, or somebody else that's a young college student over here, uh, you don't even have the experience to have any idea other than what you've been read or told. You haven't lived where that gentleman lived. I've had to work where he lives, and it's an entirely different language. So ideology has a whole breadth of experience to it. Okay, so let me reframe, let me come back with that question, the ideology, common sense. The Bill of Rights, ideology or common sense? The Bill of Rights is based on the common law from England originally, and that's what they wrote into the Constitution. And now it's us to go ahead and determine whether or not something is acceptable to the populace. So you have a young military officer over in Afghanistan went ahead and attacked a gentleman that was trying to have his way with a young boy. And now that military officer is going to be court-martialed and got rid of in the army. Is that right or is that wrong? Is it just that's how show business is in that country or is that a violation that all of us would say is unacceptable? You know, and that's the problem that we need to be able to have laws in this country that for, forget about ideology, that make common sense that we'd all agree to. Well, I, I agree with you there. What I'm trying to get to, though, is has the Bill of Rights become an ideology? No, it's common sense. It's, it's common sense for you. Common sense. Is it common sense across the board? It's common, it's common sense across the board. Now, you're an ardent defender here, I'm, I'm sensing from you, as far as the Constitution is concerned. I'm a, I'm, yeah, I'm a defender of the Constitution. Yeah. But are a constitution devised talking the mic devised developed written uh, through by people um, studying philosophy governments in across the world over centuries so it's not simply an ideology that popped out of an error. No, it my, is my an ideology is, that is based upon that is based upon based upon how do you develop a government to allow people to protect themselves and to work together? How do you devise a government that doesn't become a bigger threat to the people than the people would have faced with any of the outside threats that the government is intended to protect them? Against? Who defines what that threat is? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the point that I'm trying the, to get the, with you the, is from an people, ideological standpoint. The, the, the people should define the threat. The people should define the threat. The problem we have today is, is that people aren't defining the, the, the threat. The threat is being defined for us. And the more and more we get to that, the more difficulty we have. So as, as we talk about a grandfather who hears inflammatory words and, and gets excited in today's world, that means somebody else is defining what I need to be protected against. But I, 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 and I need to extend this just a little bit to, to, to something I wanted to share, which is a posting on Facebook from a friend in Australia. And you read, you, there's a picture, there's a picture of Ann Coulter. And for those who don't know, Ann Coulter is, is right-wing radical, I guess I would best describe her as, but who, who has a very big mouth. And there's a picture of her. And the title of the article is about restoring a respectful discourse in our <laughs> political thought. <laughs> And then, and, and I just, I, I went by it, but then I started reading the comments that were delivered against her, the most hateful things. I mean, attacking her as, well, vile. It was really, truly vile. So then I said, I better read the article. So I actually punched on the article, and I must have been the only one who did. She was not mentioned in the article. Right. The article was, was very clearly saying both right and left need to stop. And the only two people mentioned in it were, were Matthews from MSNBC and, and Rush Limbaugh. Okay. In, 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 that's what's going on in our, so we're, def, we're defining in every issue, it's a flash. It's just a flash picture and we react emotionally never to learn anything that stands behind it. Is it fair to say that social media or media in general can go through and obscure the concept of common sense and, and boil yes. up this ideology? Yes. 
Sean, you got something to say? Yeah, I was teaching um, my Laws of Evidence class today, and I was... Your which, which class? Laws of Evidence. Laws of Evidence. Yes. I thought you said Laws of Heaven. Oh, no, no, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, I wanted yeah. to clarify that. Um, uh, laws of Heaven, and that will be a different topic. We, we have to deport you if you start <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Heaven. I'm like, I don't mention Laws of Heaven. I don't carry a Quran with me. I'm like, you never know. I might be the random guy. Uh, <laughs> laws so, of Evidence. Yeah. Okay. Laws of Evidence. And I was talking about the Constitution and a couple of cases like the Zimmerman case that happened in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I tell the students, so when I look at you two gentlemen and myself, I'm in between. I tell them, I was like, I'm not black, I'm not white, I'm in between, I'm a foreigner. So when I explain, I kind of have certain level of credibility because I'm, I'm not on this side or that. That's, and I was like, that is a problem. When none of the people from left and right can talk about something because the race, the ideology, the stigma of that is stamped on it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, are, I, you, I, are you telling me that not having an opinion makes you more provisional? Being a foreigner, not black, not white, I can talk about controversial cases. Okay. I've always blamed it, I'm an immigrant, I just don't know what, how things you, work You have here. the luxury of... Yeah. <laughs> so I get the benefit in, the, in those cases and then I can explain that. What if I was black or I was white, then I'll be worried the way I try not to mention me being a Muslim anywhere these days because then no matter what I talk about, it's like, oh, he must be one of them. So I, just, I talk about American stuff. I don't talk about the, me being the Muslim. Keep it quiet. And then I can. But you're always up at the Bombay Cafe. Every time I walk in there, you're That's in there. Indian. If you have noticed, <laughs> you see, you see, after the, you know, let me tell you one thing. Why is that place called Bombay Cafe? Have you noticed? <laughs> yes. I Before 9-11, it could have been Pakistan right. Cafe, Lahore Cafe. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's Bombay Cafe mm -hmm. because of the, yeah. um, it being from India, I'm, business has I'm to I'm just playing there. out a stereotype. Oh, trust, oh, trust me, we talk about yeah. this all the time. Yeah. Sure. But I, I have a quick um, comment and uh, two things. One, I like, the second one I would like to put out for discussion, and if um, you you made uh, this, that you're not black, you're not white. But if we look at America, if we look at even our latest census that talk about the number of babies being born are more mixed race babies, and the projection that that in you know the next you know 40 years that the majority of America will be non-white. And so uh, there is a great, I, I think we have a general, even in the, it makes it a difficult conversation to even have in an African American community because there are so many mixed race people. And I think we get the issue of protecting and serving people mixed up with racism and I don't think that's the conversation. But I, that's a comment. One of the things that I really like to put in the floor for discussion, and you mentioned one of the four things that President Obama talked about, is the role of America to police the world. So if we take the small, I won't say small, but on the continuing, if we broaden that out to a world view from law enforcement's role with its citizens, and I always use the word to protect and serve, so a mediator being that person called in to protect the environment, serve and safety. But if we, I'm very interested in the pub and other people's opinion on the America's role, if we bring that out of our own neighborhood, out of our own um, states and to a global view, what is our role in protecting the world? And if we look at what we're doing, if we're going to model that on what we're doing now with on our own inhabitants, how complex is that truly? And so I'd like to hear some other people's opinion about that because my, uh, I don't have an answer, but I'd like to hear, know what other people are thinking being about Being the it. world's policeman, being yes. the world's police And that person, was one of the three things, the, the protectors, okay. yeah. And so, of the world protector in the sense of domestic violence to someone's house. But if we are going in that same element of, of being called to the duty for violence in another nation, that it's in the same small sense of going to someone's home in a domestic violence situation, what is truly our role on a, on a level as a nation? Chase, you're holding a microphone. You wanted to respond to something before this. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the whole ideology thing, but uh, I, I guess we could we, no, we can move forward. This do um, it. Go ahead. Uh, and we'll I, I find it very interesting that um, we skip over the. No we think that the Bill of Rights is common sense, 
the only, the only reason America is America is because it was a great experiment of ideology in itself. And all of us would say that the Bill of Rights is common sense because all of us agree here that that ideology is common sense. And the world has embraced the notion that our Bill of Rights is common sense about how other individuals should be treated, having nothing, uh, it, having nothing to do with that it's superior to anyone else. It was that a group of people said, this is how men should behave. How many people here have read the Quran tonight? Just by show of hands. Quran? The Quran. So there's four of us, and I, I'm not sure how many of you here. Now, I'm not a Muslim, but I've read the book. Um, there are both beautiful and also things that I don't agree with in that document. But there's also beauty in it, and I, and I cherish those passages when I do read them. Um, but from having read that, I know that I can engage in a conversation with someone about the Quran, and I can actually say what that is. The majority of America is afraid of Muslims in this country because we don't know what that document is. Islamophobia in this country is, is about five, six out of 10, according to, um, there, there's a committee out of DC that, that measures it. I did it for a school assignment, I think, for you. Um, and it's frightening. And most of it comes from a lack of misunderstanding. Um, from people from the East, for them, that document is ideology. And for them, it is common sense. And that's difficult for us to understand that because we believe in our Bill of Rights as strongly as someone else believes in another way of thinking. And the only way men, I think in my opinion, can cross that divide is when we can say, I believe what I believe and you believe what you believe and let's find some consensus. It was through consensus that our own government was formed. Um, it was through consensus that men of different color could walk on the same street. It was through consensus um, of individuals, e pluribus unum, out of many one, that through our differences in this country, we could be unified and come up with and have these dialogues together in a space like this. Um, I think that our law enforcement, if we really want to say, are we going to police the world? I don't, I don't think that's really the answer. The world has, and many times has asked us, because we are the most organized, we believe through our common sense, our Bill of Rights, our ideology that we say is common sense, that this is the way individuals should treat each other. And so we're able to defend on that level. But uh, in terms of defending the world, what we should be focused on, and, and I don't think it's a war we are prepared for, is the war of the intellectual and those who are not. We have gone over to, to a space of, of, of uh, you know, a lot of people, and I don't know if, if uh, Shadman, if you would agree, but we've gone over to the Middle East and we have killed a lot of intellectuals. I mean, we thought they were terrorists and some of them were. And when you take away the intellectuals from a country, you no longer have a basis of having dialogue, because dialogue requires education. It requires us to have a sense of, I will tolerate you, and you will tolerate me, and I will listen to what you have to say, and you will listen to what I have to say, and find that consensus. Uh, and at the moment, we don't have it. I think, I think we, it's one thing to say we're going to protect the world through law enforcement, but law enforcement, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, and uh, there's, there's a great This American Life uh, about this, that it did a two-part on police forces. And they said, law enforcement today have to go in and they don't know who's right and who's wrong. And within a quick moment of decision, they have to say who that is. And that's difficult with all the laws they have to negotiate. Um, I think if we're going to say we're going to protect the world, I think first we need to say, how are we going to um, return to a sense of protecting ourselves through consensus uh, and logic and finding consensus in that way? If we don't, we can't protect the world. We're not prepared to we will be as, as violent and radical as those who we claim are violent and radical in the world. Where's the, go ahead. Um, that just brings to mind a lot of things that I've been thinking about lately, that in order to engage about differences, we have to be deeply rooted within our own traditions first. We have to understand who we are before we can engage with the other. The standpoint. Bef yes, absolutely. And uh, there's really great work by um, Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi of Great Britain for many years, and he talks about the dignity of difference and how we engage with, um, with other cultures so that we don't have a clash of civilizations. And, um, and seeking that common ground, we can't be, na can't be naive to say, well, we throw out everything that makes us different. You can't throw out ideology because there's something that's innately and deeply human about reaching for something greater than ourselves. And so we can't be naive about that. We can't just say, oh, let, let's talk about all the vanilla stuff, all the stuff that we have in common. We have to look at what makes us different and then look at how we find the dignity within that. And then through that, I really appreciate that you brought up reading you know, the, the sacred texts of, of, um, of the Quran. 
um, through being rooted within our own maybe faith traditions, maybe intellectual traditions, whatever they are, being deeply rooted in those, then we can learn the language to speak to somebody else and we can actually interact with their texts or with their ideologies that allow us to engage well instead of just dominating. So what I'm getting from you here is first off a sense of responsibility for what it is that we might be doing and then to become fully vetted in whatever it is we want to explore as far as those opinions are concerned Absolutely. before making our own assertions about those. Okay, all right. Dallas? I, I like what you said about uh, having an understanding of, of who we are before we're able to en engage. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Eddie Izzard. He's uh, a stand-up comic. Somewhat, he's a cross-dressing stand-up comic. Come he's on, a, a, a somewhat well-read British <laughs> cross-dressing stand-up comic. And, and he, he, he made this, and I'll, 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 I'll dumb the rating down a little bit. I've got 10 minutes left, too, by the way. He said, uh, so I hear in the United States, or excuse me, in the United States is, in America is planning to build a Euro Disney. He said, I'd be careful about building castles over here. We really have them. <laughs> Point taken, right? I think part of identifying who we are, one, is, is, is a dichotomy uh, in America, in the United States particularly, is the, is the dichotomy of, of humility and hubris. That, that when those founding documents were written, some of the people who wrote them owned slaves. And, and that is, that, that's just not discussed. When, when America is referred to as the greatest country in the world, that, that, that's, it's almost like the elephant in the room that nobody wants to discuss. How can, you, how can you expect other countries to take us seriously? How can you expect anybody to take you seriously? Does two centuries of beating our chest to that tune yeah. put us in the yeah. predicament that we're in? Well, you know, I mean, what, what, did, what did Hitler's right, man, right hand man say? You tell a lie enough times, it becomes the truth. Well, well I, I so, have a anyways. comment on that that I, to me in history, when we talk about, when you add slavery into the Constitution, well, I believe what America did was was pivotal. It was something to be celebrated. Slavery, not in terms of the African coast, but slavery as an institution all over the world was a, a way of economic of a, exchange of labor. But we were the first country, and for me, if there's something to be celebrated, we were the first country in the same constitution that freed them with that amendment, with the provision, but in the same constitution that was able to be pliable enough, to, pliable enough in its inception to do that. And for me, that is something, if you, just like when your child goes off to school and said this they've done well, or that's something I do believe that I personally feel honored to say that's what, with, with all its tragedies, that is our triumphant moment in world history to me. Um, and um, Can we wave that banner, though, at this point? Are we able to? Um, I think we can wave the banner. It does not mean that something else has occurred, but I think it could still be recognized as something that was true and vital for its time. Thank you, Eric. Uh, very good points. I th I th I'm sitting over here. I'm being quiet the whole time, uh, trying to think what I want to say to add to the conversation. But I feel that we have to be able to admit that we're wrong when we're wrong, that we have to realize, especially when we're talking about Facebook conversations and immediately jumping on people having these ad hominem attacks. Um, and Attacking the character, not the content. Right. Okay. Uh, we're wrong. We, we, we progress in ideas. We, we learn new information and maybe we do flip-flop, but we're supposedly progressing towards something greater and better, more understanding. Hopefully that's what we're doing. Uh, I, I think maybe we should all be uh, looking at both sides and maybe try to prove the opposite similar to the scientific method if we really want to gain an understanding of what something. What prohibits that from happening to us? Is it our I ego? Don't know. Is I, it our... I made a complete chain for gay marriage, for example. I was totally against it. And then I had to do an assignment in school and uh, persuade people to view it the opposite way. And it got me to open up my mind and realize 
I wasn't right or I, I may be wrong about certain things and I ended up changing my mind. I, I, I can't change your mind. Uh, it all has to come within. Uh, but if you can provoke a thoughtful discourse and realize that maybe I can be wrong on some things and somebody else has more knowledge, let's talk about it and maybe we could get rid of the Islamophobia. Maybe we can get rid of racism altogether, but it's going to take willingness. Go ahead, please. Um, some things we want to do, but they're not really possible. Um, when I was coming to the US, I'm from a third world country. I had to study, you see, I had to in college, in law school, American constitution, the British system, all of those things. When I came and I watched movies in Hollywood and all those, that <laughs> stuff. When I came here, I knew more about the US system than my friends at the law school. They're like, uh, so many people would tell me they feel so bad you from Pakistan know more about the US and we don't I was like well you don't have to because I'm from a third world country I came here because it's a land of the immigrants so I had to learn you can't just start in the morning and start reading the Constitution of 200 countries you, you don't have to first that's practically that's not possible one um, the other thing is that um, when we look at the Constitution that's when the Constitution began, more than 200 years ago. What happened after that? Uh, we, segregation is legal, turn of the century. Then segregation becomes illegal. That's what I explain to the students. I tell them homosexuality first was a crime. Alan Turing was punished for the crime of homosexuality. Then it becomes a joke. Then it becomes sensitive. Then it becomes the law. Mm -hmm. Now, we have progressed over here. What if someone disagrees with homosexuality? Today, if someone does that, then he or she will be demonized in the society. Especially Dis if they have a Twitter account. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I don't have Twitter or Facebook and stuff. Uh, so when that happens, uh, I tell the students, if you disagree, you can. No one should demonize you. It's how you disagree. If you go into what, then that's a problem. Uh, U.S., for me, the biggest victory, I'm not Republican, not Democrat, I can't vote, I'm not a citizen, but when U.S. elected Obama as the president, that was a big victory for U.S., that all the history that you see, that's excellent, I mean, that's an example. The way, and then the opposite side, they're still talking about, should a woman be the president of the country? Well, in an Islamic country, in 1988, there was a female prime minister. Total opposites then. And over here, they're still debating. Is a woman capable enough to be the, the uh, president? Uh, look at the jury, um, 12 angry men. I was like, watch any old movie, you'll see only men in the jury box. It should have been maybe 12 angry men and uh, nine angry men and three angry women or something like that. <laughs> and those women would be strong and then just take over the, the nine men. Uh, <laughs> but we have evolved, there's some things very good this is still the best place to be. People from all over the world are coming here for a reason. But then we have the opposites also. At the San Francisco... Are you implying that this is still a good country? Is that what you're saying? Yes, because you have to compare it to other parts of the world. Right. If you have traveled, if you go to third world countries, if you live there, if you look at their system, if you look at their police, you're like, well, I am in heaven. You start feeling so good. Well, I can't tell you how refreshing it is to hear that. Oh, trust me. I'm. A the foreigner guy. Right. <laughs> so I'll just add one thing in the end. Um, okay. I was in San Francisco airport. One and a half minutes. It's 10 seconds. Okay. San Francisco airport. I was, of course, the random guy on the airport. So three and a half hours they kept. You're me. always the random guy. <laughs> but there was a problem. I had the book of A to Z of jihadi groups in oh. Pakistan in my luggage. <laughs> so they checked it. Uh, so, so the guy asks me, um, a oriental and he was like why do you want to be in this country I was like why have you been in this country so it happens it's like the earlier immigrants always hate the new immigrants so I just <laughs> <laughs> it trust me we faced that <laughs> okay I think that's what I had to say wow amazing then a few moments left just a thought I want to part with you uh, and I, I hope we have this chance to come back and do this again or you know maybe we'll just wrap up the show and maybe continue the conversation if we can and I wish I had some kind of social media to go back to uh, to continue this conversation for those of you view viewing uh, at home, but we don't. 
So I'll just leave it at that. But I want to put it out there. Anthropologist Helen Fisher had indicated that uh, until we address the chasm that still exists between men and women, we will not be able to address any other ills of society. What do you think, very quickly? Agree, disagree? I, I, I totally agree because I believe that the only re the reason Obama was president was voted because they didn't want a woman. And if you look at the Constitution, where the white men gave their slave freedom before their wives, their mothers, and their mistresses. Mm -hmm. And so I personally do not believe that that was the case. I believe it was the lesser choice. All right, well, that's it. Thank you for here. I'll turn around. Thank you for joining us. I can't even see the camera from here. Uh, please join us again. We're going to do this in March, April? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, but well. We want to do it again. We want to do it again. We hope you join us. And thank you so much for joining us as well and for lending your voice to what's been going on.